Carissimi Cari... amici di Fede Cultura, bentrovati a questo appuntamento sul canale YouTube di Fede e Cultura. Oggi abbiamo il grande piacere di avere con noi come ospite il professor George Weigel. Bentrovato, gra... thank you to be here, Mr. Weigel. Piacere Gaetano, and uh, thank you for having me, and let me thank Giovanni for uh, publishing my little book, Il Prossimo Papa, which I think we'll be talking about uh, in the next little while. Bene, e come sapete carissimi amici, il professor Weigel, teologo cattolico, nonché uno dei principali commentatori americani di questioni religiose e di vita pubblica, è eh, collaboratore di Newsweek e opinionista per NBC News su problematiche legate alla Santa Sede. Eh, Weigel è autore di numerosi libri, tra i quali spiccano sicuramente il bestseller Testimone della speranza sulla vita di San Giovanni Paolo II e La scelta di Dio, che parla dell'ascesa di Ratzinger al soglio petrino nonché anche appunto The Next Pope, che noi di Fede Cultura abbiamo pubblicato in italiano con il titolo Il prossimo Papa, e adesso vi mostro ancora una volta la copertina, Il prossimo Papa, l'ufficio di Pietro e la missione della Chiesa. Quest'oggi parleremo con il professor Weigel anche un po' magari dei contenuti eh, di questo testo. Saluto anche il professor Giovanni Zenone, direttore di Fede e Cultura, Qui lascio la parola per introdurre anche questa interessante intervista con il nostro ospite. Grazie Gaetano e grazie anche al professor Weigel di essere qui con noi. Eh, è un giorno importante anche per noi di Fede Cultura perché avere il più importante biografo di Papa Giovanni Paolo II con noi è un onore eh, grandissimo e un eh, osservatore così attento e così sensibile alla fede cattolica, all'autentica fede cattolica, eh, dopo tanta amicizia con Giovanni Paolo II, anche questo ci fa onore. E il libro che noi abbiamo pubblicato di George Weigel, Il prossimo Papa, è davvero uno strumento per non perdere la rotta e per non rischiare di prendere delle sbandate durante quella che Papa Benedetto XVI chiama una battaglia navale nella notte in tempesta, che è la situazione della Chiesa che noi stiamo vivendo oggi. Allora, eh, qual è il senso di questo libro? È quali sono le sfide che dovrà affrontare il prossimo Papa quando questa tempesta così terribile si sarà attenuata e rimarranno forse eh, molti naufraghi, rimarranno delle barche scassate, ecco. Ma quali saranno le grandi sfide del prossimo Papa, i problemi centrali della vita della Chiesa che andranno risolti? Eh, ce lo, ci aiuterà lui a, ad affrontare un pochino questi temi. Ecco, allora prima di affrontare, di analizzare un po' quelli, quello che potrà essere il prossimo pontificato, cerchiamo anche di, mh, di capire, con l'aiuto della prospettiva privilegiata di George Weigel, quale, in che condizioni diciamo così, si, si trova, cosa caratterizza il pontificato presente di Francesco, ma anche il pontificato di Benedetto XVI. Quindi la prima domanda, first question, what is the distinctive trait of Pope Francis pontificate? Qual è il tratto distintivo, peculiare, ciò che caratterizza il pontificato di Papa Francesco? I think it will be hard to identify one, identify one specific characteristic of this pontificate. One could name several. Uh, the Pope's manifest concern for poor people around the world, uh, his passionate interest in the question of migrants uh, and their place in our world. But beyond that, which is what the world media talks about all the time. I think there are several characteristics of this pontificate that are surprising in light of the conclave of 2013, uh, in which Cardinal Bergoglio was presented as a stern reformer uh, who would clean up uh, the various scandals uh, in the Roman Curia. 
And while there has been some effort to address the financial problems of the Holy See, other characteristics of the pontificate uh, were simply not expected uh, in 2013. First of all, uh, I think it is true to say, and I say this in a completely neutral, non-polemical way, this is the most autocratic pontificate in centuries. Uh, the Pope governs as if he were the headmaster of a Jesuit high school. Uh, his is a very Jesuit, Jesuitical mode of governance. <laughs> he does not uh, have much respect for normal process uh, in decision making. Uh, he often acts and speaks very impulsively. Most recently, when he called on Ukraine to raise the white flag of, of negotiation, that was certainly not uh, a proposal that had been thought through in the relevant dicasteries of the Roman Curia. I would say another characteristic of this pontificate that no one expected in 2013 was its efforts over the past 11 years now to deconstruct the legacy of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Uh, this is not the way Cardinal Bergoglio was presented by those advocating his candidacy in 2013. And yet in initiative after initiative, we have seen what amounts to a systematic effort to deconstruct the legacies of two great popes. We see this in uh, the synods of 2014 and 2015, which were clearly an attempt to dismantle the legacy of teaching uh, of John Paul II on marriage and the family, specifically in the uh, apostolic uh, exhortation Familiaris Consortio. We have seen this in a very dramatic way in the total reconstruction, or I would say deconstruction, of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Marriage and the Family at, at the Lateran University. We see this in a constant uh, criticism, often subtle, but nonetheless unmistakable, of the teaching of the encyclical Veritatis Splendor. And there is very little in the social doctrine, the social teaching of Pope Francis that uh, seems to be a development of the social magisterium of John Paul II, for example, in the encyclical Centesimus Annus. Uh, as for Benedict XVI, uh, the issuing of the decree Traditionis Custodes, which eventually essentially repealed the uh, uh, decree of Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, Sumorum Pontificum, is is an obvious is an obvious example. So those who claim, as for example, Cardinal Zuppi did recently, that this is a pontificate of continuity with John Paul II and Benedict XVI, uh, I think have a very difficult, in, indeed impossible, case to make. This is a pontificate, this has been, a pontificate of significant rupture with its two predecessors. Yes, and I think that it's also a very self-referential uh, magisterium, because è anche un magistero autoreferenziale, Spesso, because often uh, the Pope just uh, uh, quote himself and not the, um, popes, the Popes before him. Il Papa Francesco eh, cita se stesso eh, e, e non cita i papi precedenti se non per affermare una generica continuità che in realtà è molto difficile trovare. Eh, 
it's very difficult to find a continuity between him and the others. But the second question I would like to make is, uh, what is the distinctive uh, trait of Pope Benedict uh, pontificate, pontificate? Qual è il tratto distintivo del pontificato di Papa Benedetto and the difference between him and Francis? Well, the most obvious, I think, is uh, the most obvious difference is that Benedict's pontificate was one of luminous clarity in teaching. Uh, at the time of his death, Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, was arguably the most learned man in the world. Uh, he was extraordinarily well read, not only in theology and scripture studies, but in philosophy and political theory, in the history of art, in the history of literature. This is a man who was a kind of walking encyclopedia, and yet he had a unique capacity to make all of that learning come alive in essays, in books, in homilies, in magisterial documents that could be engaged by anyone. He was, I would argue, the greatest papal preacher, homilist, since Pope Gregory the Great. And I am quite confident that 50, 100, 200 years from now, uh, many of those spiritual writings of, of Benedict XVI will be in the divine office. They'll be part of the office of readings in the church's official daily prayer. Benedict XVI was also a man with a very clear understanding of the crisis of the Western world today. If you look at his four September lectures at Regensburg in Paris, in London, and at the Bundestag in, in Berlin, he had a very, very clear analysis of the moral crisis of the West, of the democratic crisis of the West, which was unfolding because the West had lost touch, has lost touch, with its roots in Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. Uh, our roots, our cultural roots in biblical religion, in Greek philosophy, and in, in Roman law. And he could explicate that uh, in, a very, in a very powerful way that has simply not been present in the social magisterium of the pontificate of Pope Francis, which seems to have been uh, far more uh, focused on issues such as climate change, uh, migration, et cetera, which are not really discussed in the context of the social doctrine of the church from Leo the 13th uh, through Benedict the 16th. So those are some distinctions that, that I would see. There's one other that I think should be mentioned here. Uh, one of the characteristic initiatives of the pontificate of Pope Francis is the arrangement he made with the People's Republic of China on the appointment of Catholic bishops in China. This arrangement, the details of which have never been made public, seems to have handed virtual control, certainly the initiative, in the appointment of Catholic bishops in China to the Chinese Communist Party. This was a deal that both John Paul II and Benedict XVI could have made, and both declined to make it because they understood that this kind of a deal was a violation of the church's own canon law, which was itself a reflection of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council in his decree on the pastoral office of bishops in the church, which said that for the future, no concessions are to be made to states or governments, much less communist parties, in the appointment of Catholic bishops. So this is a fundamental dividing line between the two predecessor pontificates and the pontificate of Pope Francis. What should be the distinctive trait 
of the next pope, quali saranno i tratti distintivi del prossimo papa? Well, I'll go back to that little book of mine, Il prossimo papa, which Fede Cultura was was kind enough to publish in Italian. The first thing the new the next pope needs to understand is the nature of the office of Peter. The office of Peter exists to foster the unity of the church and to be a point of doctrinal and moral clarity in the church. The office of Peter does not exist to facilitate debate. It doesn't exist to create arguments. It exists to settle arguments. And the next pope really needs to understand that. Uh, secondly, I would say that the next pope, Il Prossimo Papa, uh, has to understand that the new evangelization, the idea of a church permanently in mission, in which everyone is a missionary disciple, that is the grand strategy of the Catholic Church in the world of the 21st century and beyond. The next pope should understand that those parts of the world church that have grasped that and that are living the new evangelization are the living parts of the church throughout the world, whereas the dying parts of the church throughout the world are those that continue to try to make the failed project of progressive Catholicism, or what I have called Catholic light, work. It doesn't work. No one is interested in ambiguity from the Catholic Church. We live surrounded by a culture of ambiguity and relativism. No one wants more of that. Those who are attracted to the Catholic Church are attracted to it, because the Catholic Church has a creed in which it believes. It has a moral doctrine which it thinks facilitates human happiness and ultimately beatitude. The Catholic Church has answers, if you will. Now, it has to propose those answers in an accessible and indeed humble way, but it cannot deny that it's the bearer of truths truths that we can know by reason, truths that we know by divine revelation. And this would lead me to one final point on this question. The basic issue in the synods of 2014 and 2015, the synod of 2018, the Amazonian synod, and now the synod on synodality is this can put it very simply. Is divine revelation real and does it have authority over time, binding authority over time, or not? This was the issue in 2014 and 2015. Do we take seriously what the Lord Jesus said about the nature of marriage? Do we take seriously what St. Paul said about worthiness to receive Holy Communion, or don't we? That's the fundamental question at stake here. The collapse of liberal Protestantism throughout the Western world over the past 200 years has been because liberal Protestantism said no to those questions. Is divine revelation real? Does it have binding authority over time? The Catholic Church would be very, very ill-advised to go down that road. That is the road to ecclesiastical incoherence and eventually to ecclesial death. Faced with this kind of problems, I think that life of the new Pope will be very, very difficult also because with the cardinals, uh, the voter cardinals that we, ha we will have at the death of Pope Francis, the majority of them uh, elected by uh, Pope Francis, 
uh, I, I fear really, and many people fear there will be no hope for the church. Con i cardinali che abbiamo ho paura che non ci sarà speranza e che il Papa prossimo avrà delle difficoltà veramente grandissime eh, quando sarà eletto. Eh, but but um, how do you see so the uh, near future of the church? Uh, with hope or not many people do not have hope and escape or go to the orthodox churches or uh, build up their own church like uh, martin luther uh, proclaiming that they are the true catholic and the catholic church is not more catholic uh, tanti scappano e vanno tra gli con gli ortodossi davanti a questa crisi e questa mancanza di speranza alcuni dicono di essere loro la vera chiesa cattolica la chiesa cattolica ha perso la via quindi loro come martin lutero si proclamano i veri cattolici uh, so um, how do you see the uh, near future of the church and uh, if with hope or not uh, I see it with great hope, um, and those who have lost hope seem to me to have lost faith uh, or have weakened in their faith. Uh, it's very important to remember that while there are libraries of books of church history, there is only one divinely revealed book of church history, the Acts of the Apostles. And how does it end? It ends with a shipwreck. But the shipwreck becomes the occasion to bring the gospel to where it has not been preached before. That's not simply something that happened to St. Paul in the Eastern Mediterranean 2,000 years ago. That's a metaphor for the church's life throughout history. We're always in turbulent waters. But if we understand those turbulent waters, as an invitation to take the gospel, not only where it hasn't been before, but where it's been forgotten, then we can navigate those turbulent waters uh, in a faithful way. On the matter of ex-conclave, this notion that because Pope Francis has appointed a certain percentage of the cardinal electors, therefore the next pope will be Pope Francis 2.0. This is, this is mytho mythological nonsense. Pope Francis was elected by an electorate that was appointed entirely by, Paul the, uh, by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. John XXIII was elected by a, uh, by a cardinal electorate that was appointed entirely by Pius XI and Pius XII. Pius X was appointed by an electorate entirely created by Leo XIII, and in all three cases, something very different than what the appointing pope might have expected happened. So it's just not true that uh, because a pope appoints a certain percentage of the college that will elect his successor, he's going to get a pope in his own image. That has been historically falsified uh, over the last several uh, centuries. Uh, secondly, I think a lot of the new cardinals are men of great faith, uh, particularly these cardinals from the so-called peripheries. Uh, they are not interested in Western decadence. They are not interested in becoming like the church in Germany. Uh, they understand that the church grows when the church is firm in its convictions and compassionate in its pro proclamation of those convictions. So the notion that all of these cardinals are somehow soft doctrinally or morally is just false on, on my experience of them uh, in any event. Third, uh, even those members of the College of Cardinals who might be sympathetic to some of the initiatives of the present pontificate uh, are not happy with the chaos in the Roman Curia. They're not happy with the autocracy in the papacy. Uh, I think a return to normal order in the church is going to be a high priority in the next conclave. 
And uh, that should give us uh, confidence that uh, the Holy Spirit has not abandoned the church. To, to be without hope for the future of the church is to have lost faith that the Holy Spirit knows what he is doing. Uh, even if it's hard for us to figure out what that is uh, at any uh, given uh, moment. Finally, I would say look to the living parts of the world church to find hope. Uh, the tremendous growth of the church in sub-Saharan Africa over the past 50 years is a marvelous example of the new evangelization at work. Uh, these are local churches that are not interested in becoming uh, examples of uh, following the example of, of Germany or Belgium or wherever. Uh, there's a lot of life in the church here in the United States. Many, many good things uh, going on. So it's not, <laughs> the bad news is not all the news there is. And, and particularly as we uh, go through the Easter season, it's important to keep that in mind. So, um, are there currently personalities in the College of Cardinals capable of bringing order to the chaos that reigns supreme in doctrinal, theological, liturgical, and disciplinary matters? Ci sono oggi personalità nel Collegio Cardinalizio capaci un domani di riportare davvero ordine nel caos che regna supremo quanto riguarda materie dottrinale, teologica, liturgica e disciplinare? Uh, sure there are. Um, there, there are plenty of them. Uh, I'm not going to name names right now, uh, but I'm quite confident uh, that there are many members of the College of Cardinals who want to return to the direction, uh, the dynamically orthodox direction that John Paul II and Benedict XVI set for the church. But there's another point that needs to be made here. We're talking about the papacy in, in this interview, but the reclamation or the rebuilding of order, as you put it, doctrinal, theological, liturgical, disciplinary, That belongs to the work of local bishops throughout the world church. Uh, this notion that only the Pope can restore order is, is just wrong. And it's certainly not congruent with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, which taught that every local bishop is a vicar of Christ in his own diocese. Yeah. And he takes an oath of fidelity to It's that scary. doctrinal tradition. Uh, before he is ordained a bishop. So, you know, we need to get a little less popocentric here, yeah, <laughs> a little yeah. less uh, ultramontane, if you will, in, in thinking about the future of the church. Yes, but the problem is that some uh, liturgical or uh, other matters, especially moral matters, he made some changes uh, through the way of the pastoral that uh, are deeply, deeply uh, moral and enter in the in the faith of Catholic Church. So will the next Pope have the strength to say that is not Catholic, we have to return to order? Uh, because I think that more than deconstruction, we can speak of demolition. But if there is demolition, we have to rebuild the, the building. Uh, anyway. But the last, uh, not last, but one of the problems is, uh, what do you think? Will uh, Pope Bergoglio uh, open to female deacons, uh, to abolition of celibacy and the entry of lay people into the conclave or not? And uh, for, for this matter, we can be uh, tranquil, cal calm. Well, let's go back uh, a moment to uh, the question of whether the next pope uh, will restore order. Um, I think he will, uh, because the church is, is not happy uh, with disorder. Uh, this air turbulence that we've been experiencing 
is not welcomed except by a, a very small minority of uh, leaders in the church who generally represent local churches that are, are, that are dying. Uh, secondly, let me go back to what I said about local bishops. If there is liturgical disorder in a diocese, the person responsible for fixing that is the local bishop. <laughs> a friend of mine on becoming a bishop in one part of the United States disbanded his diocesan liturgical commission and said, I'm the chief liturgist of this diocese. I am responsible for the proper celebration of the sacred mysteries, and we don't really need a committee to do that. Uh, that's That was a good move. I mean, part of our problem in the church over the past 50 years, it seems to me, is that we have become incredibly over-bureaucratized. And uh, as my old friend, Cardinal Francis George of Chicago, arguably the most brilliant bishop in the history of the American hierarchy, once said to me, he said, Jesus Christ did not intend his church to be governed by committees. Yeah. I think that's something to keep in mind. On the specific questions you raised, Giovanni, uh, the Pope has already said in a book uh, interview published in Spanish, but apparently no place else, that no, there will not be women deacons because the Holy Orders is one sacrament in three grades. And Ordinatio Sacerdotalis of John Paul II settled the question of uh, ordination of women to the priesthood, which settles the question both up and down in the other grades, episcopacy and, and diaconate. So that that is simply a non-starter. Um, I don't know so much about celibacy. I, there will undoubtedly continue to be pushes for ordaining so-called viri probati in, um, in uh, you know, difficult missionary situations. My argument is that what places like the Amazon need is not married priests. They need evangelists. They need catechists. These are largely unchristian areas. And before we start talking about the necessity of priests for the celebration of the sacraments, we need to talk about the necessity of Christians to celebrate the sacraments. So I'm I'm less sure about that, but I I I don't I think the Pope has actually said some very good things in praise of the discipline of celibacy. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, lay people in a conclave is just off the table. Now, whether there is going to be some attempt to bring non-cardinals into the general congregations of cardinals that precede a conclave before the conclave is locked up, uh, I don't know. I think that would be a very bad idea, um, but um, one never knows in the present circumstances. I think that idea would be fiercely resisted by the members of the College of Cardinals and would create something of a, a real crisis at the next uh, uh, interregnum uh, or papal transition. So no, I am not really worried about any of those uh, three things. But as I say, you know, one never knows uh, in the present circumstance. What worries you so? If you are not worried for those things, di cosa sei preoccupato se non ti preoccupano quelle questioni che abbiamo nominato prima? I, I, what, what I am concerned about, or the question, not so much concerned about, is it's, it's a question of hope. I, I hope the next Pope uh, has the courage to address the disorder problems quickly. Uh, there's always a tendency to say, well, let's deal with this slowly, let's not rock the boat, uh, let's move gently, but uh, definitively back on course. I, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, I, I think the next pope, for example, should, should make it clear that fiducia supplicans uh, and this business of offering uh, blessings to same-sex couples uh, it is not is not the teaching of the church that that needs to be uh, clarified right at at the very beginning. 
uh, I think I would, if I were the next pope, uh, I would repeal Traditionis Custodes uh, quickly. I let me emphasize: I am a Novus Ordo man. Uh, I am not uh, enamored or yearning and pining for a return to the Tridentine rite, but others find this a source of spiritual strength, and it should not be denied them. So uh, Traditionis Custodes could be quietly, or maybe not so quietly, uh, buried. Um, there are certain personalities in the present Curia who, in my judgment, should not be reappointed to their offices. Um, as you know, all of the heads of dicasteries in the Roman Curia lose their office at the death or abdication of the Pope. You simply don't reappoint certain of those people. You don't have to positively uh, fire people or uh, remove them from office. You simply don't reappoint them. So uh, I can think of any number of signals like that that would indicate that a major course correction is underway. And the willingness of a man to do that should be, in my judgment, one of the measures by which candidates for the papacy are assessed. So um, what do you think about uh, Demos Q letter, the project uh, about next pontificate that uh, has been published um, a few weeks ago and from uh, presumably from anonymous cardinals since the name remembers Demos one the pseudonym used by the mourned cardinal George Pell cosa cosa ne pensa del, della lettera firmata Demos 2 questo progetto sul prossimo pontificato che mh, pubblicato qualche diverse settimane fa, a firma di mh, questo appunto Demos 2, presumibilmente si tratta di uh, cardinale, un cardinale anonimo, da, dal momento che il nome appunto ricorda Demos, lo pseudonimo utilizzato dal compianto cardinale George Pell. Uh, let's begin with Demos 1. Uh, Cardinal Pell was my oldest friend at the time of his death. We had been friends for 55 years. We were in constant contact uh, in the weeks before his death. And I can say with quite certain conviction that he was not the only author of Demos I. He may have put it into its final form, but that was the product of, of many hands. And uh, that needs to be understood. Uh, I think Demos II is a calm, sober, accurate description of the present situation. And I hope it is taken seriously for that. Uh, in fact, I will be so bold to say, <laughs> if you put Demos II, here's what's going not so right in the church, together with Il Prossimo Papa, here's, here's where we should be going. Uh, you've got a pretty good program for the whole church's discussion of the Catholic future. Okay. So thank you, George Weigel, for having accepted to um, do this interview with us, with Fede Cultura. Grazie, George Weigel, per aver accettato di fare questa intervista, di concederci questa intervista. E non so se il professor Zenone vuole aggiungere qualcosa prima di salutarci. Hope to make a new book with uh, Fede Cultura together. <laughs> Spero di fare un libro con, con lei, con Fede Cultura. Uh, uh, in italiano, first of all, in, in Italian. <laughs> Sarà un gran piacere. Grazie. Grazie. <laughs> grazie ancora, professor Weigel. Grazie, professor Zenone. Grazie a tutti voi, cari amici, per la vostra attenzione. Ovviamente vi ricordo che potete trovare il libro di George Weigel, il prossimo Papa, il link qui in descrizione. E anche, ecco, il professor Zenone sta mostrando la copertina, anche tra i prodotti taggati qui nel video. E, come sempre, vi ricordo anche che il vostro sostegno è particolarmente importante. Trovate nella descrizione del video tutte le informazioni per sostenerci tramite donazioni. Sul sito trovate, come ripetiamo sempre, durante le dirette 
alla pagina donazioni pulsante per eventualmente impostare anche una donazione eh, mensile e bene, bene vi saluto e vi ringrazio come sempre per la vostra attenzione e ci vediamo a un prossimo appuntamento non so se il professore vuole aggiungere qualcosa al professor Zenone no va bene così. grazie thank you Mr. Weigel thank you grazie Thank mm -hmm. you.